Hey, listeners, welcome once again to the Asset Reliability at Work podcast. I'm your host, Derek Kelly. In today's episode, we welcome Paul Borders back to the podcast, but this time he'll cover the concept of a reliability excellence dashboard. Paul will talk through the various stages of maturity that dashboards will go through, as well as understanding the importance of different metrics. And finally, we'll finish up by discussing the leadership and behavioral aspects of leading through a dashboard. Now let's get the conversation started with Paul Borders in making performance visible using a reliability excellence dashboard. Hey, Paul, welcome back to the podcast. Now it is your second time back to the podcast, so you must have done something right your first time. Well, that's right. So it's good to be back. <laughs> okay, listeners. Well, typically, uh, the previous episode, I introduced a co-host, Tara Holwegner, who fortunately for her and unfortunately for us is actually on vacation. But Paul, I don't know exactly where you vacation when you live in Charleston, South Carolina, which is, I believe, the number one city, the uh, tourist destination. It, it's a uh, it's a great place to come home to, that's for sure. <laughs> Perhaps we uh, we visit up north and be up in the cold for our vacations, but uh, we'll move right into it and get the conversation started here, Paul. So let me first talk to you about this reliability excellence dashboard and the purpose behind that. Can you go into more detail about that? Yeah. So, you know, Reliability excellence dashboards are, uh, I, I would say there's really two principal purposes. Uh, one is, is it's simply a way of making performance visible. And, and I would say that the other uh, major purpose is that it's, it, it's a, a very useful tool um, of how to tell uh, your reliability journey story to others. Um, and there's certainly new stakeholders and new leaders that come into the organization and um, – uh, if your business is data driven, there's a, a lot of benefit to be had by going to the data and sharing the story to enroll others in the journey. Okay, so, so you said uh, the dashboard is simply a way of making performance more visible. How so? Yeah, so, you know, oftentimes we're working with clients that have a whole lot of things going on in their operation. Um, you know, they've got lots of equipment failures, they've got lots of of uh, um, uh, different um, improvement events that they're trying to do, and there's just simply a huge amount of noise in the organization. So, so the dashboard really gives visibility to a lot of the key aspects of the reliability journey. When there's other, there's a lot of other things garnering the attention of leaders. So, um, it's it's really pretty cool in the way that it can focus you over the long term. Um, you know, the, the, the tool itself is really straightforward, right? It's, it's usually just a, uh, a color-coded um, uh, matrix of, of uh, time versus different measures. And in, in, its, in, in its simplicity, it can be applied at different levels in the organization. So we, we oftentimes see people applying it like at, at a maintenance department level. Um, where I'm used to standing it up and where I'm used to utilizing it the most is at a plant leadership level, and you've got lots of different uh, departments uh, down below you. Um, but we have uh, corporate, reliability, corporate reliability leaders uh, applying it even at a multi-plant level. So, you know, it, it is simple, um, and it can be applied at lots of different places in the organization. I also mentioned it's it's a great way of sort of telling your reliability journey story to others. In in our change management methodology, building a coalition of like-minded sponsors with others is is a critical aspect of, of building some forward momentum. And a lot of the a lot of stakeholders to the reliability journey are outside of the plant. So you can have corporate personnel, you can have various folks within the community, you can have additional practitioners like consultants that help you. And um, the, the, the Reliability Excellence Dashboard really is a, uh, a great way to sort of get the journey in front of others. I'll tell you a quick story. Back in, in my very early years when I was starting to be a, a practitioner as well, I was a young plant manager at a, at a large um, vinyl siding operation. In, in North Carolina, and we had a uh, some corporate reliability support, and uh, the, the guy that I worked with was uh, just a terrific guy named Dennis Patrick, and and Dennis uh, stood up a, a, a reliability excellence dashboard as part of his job functions, um, and and I hadn't utilized it as a tool at the at the plant level yet, so we were very busy. Um, 
uh, going along and, and implementing reliability and doing major overhauls to equipment and training people and uh, jerking some through a knot hole to <laughs> try to try to get their heads where we needed to be. And after about a year of doing that, Dennis showed up with this dashboard that I'd seen a time or two, and he told me congratulations. And I said, well, why are you congratulating me? He said, well, he said, even though your measurement systems don't tell this to you very clearly, um, your reliability ex- excellence dashboard indicates that you've generated about two million bucks in productivity Whoa. because of the uh, the improvements in OEE. And I said, really? I said, well, you know, my my certainly my my plant performance metrics at a corporate level don't say that. And he said, well, he said it's really quite simple. We've just calculated how much OEE um, is worth, and, and specifically how much one percent of OEE improvement. And he said you've improved it about four points in this first year, and that translates to a little over $2 million. So, you know, obviously money speaks in the business environment, so I uh, quickly started paying attention to what he was doing. And and really over the the next four and five years I was at that site, that was a central tool that we used to, you know, basically park the metrics on that we wanted to focus on. And it also, you know, revealed a lot of um, plateaus and uh, performance um, uh, challenges that we had over time. So, so anyhow, I'm uh, now now that I'm much farther along in my career, I do the same with others. But it's um, it, it 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 is a great way of enrolling uh, others in your reliability story. That's for sure. Wow. Well, two million dollars. That's a that's a lot of extra cash to invest in uh, in your company. Jeez. Yeah, that was well, a, a good one. We got a lot of good attention uh, in the early years for that one. That's great. Well, you know, I mentioned uh, in my introduction that RX dashboards go through different phases of maturity. Can you talk about the maturity phases? Yeah. So, you know, earlier in my career, I thought when you set up a dashboard, you would just simply put a list of the metrics that you wanted to measure, and then you would start uh, uh, demanding that they be um, uh, populated, and you would start focusing on those metrics to drive improvement. As I've gone through and and practiced this a lot, I would tell you that there's really at least three phases that um, dashboards in general, and specifically a reliability excellence dashboard, would go through. The, the first one I would call uh, really is the developmental phase, and that's really deciding what metrics to measure. Now, at a, at a plant level, that's a pretty quick uh, exercise. You, you gain consensus among your, your operations manager, maybe your reliability um, uh, support that you've got and your your senior leadership and you decide okay this is what we want to measure it's it becomes much more complicated when you're looking at a multi plant level there's a lot of consensus that needs to be gained and aligned from lots of different stakeholders a lot of who's got different agendas so uh, so the developmental phase can be really quick or it can be quite uh, quite speedy I, I worked with a large metals company that had um, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of, um, of of operations here domestically, and the developmental phase for them was uh, nearly a year as they uh, gained um, gained alignment across the organization. So the the first is developmental phase. The, really, the second phase is what I would call the implementation phase, and and candidly, it it is really characterized by what I would just call a mess. It, it's a very messy phase. You're determining who's responsible for populating the metric. You're struggling with where do we get the sources of information. You're struggling with the time frames. For example, you might set up your scorecard to be on a monthly basis, but your uh, enterprise asset management system might be tempering off of weeks or what have you. So it can be messy in the time frame standpoint. And, and also there's typically struggles with the consistency of calculation, especially uh, from uh, shift to shift and especially from plant to plant if you're at, at a multi-plant level. So the implementation phase is really is, is a messy phase, and I would tell you that, that leadership sponsorship and energy through that implementation phase is really critical because, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like there's just a lot of headwinds during that phase. And if the uh, leadership expectations of the leaders is not to get it baked in and get the dashboard stood up, um, it can sort of uh, uh, die in committee uh, at that phase. So it's a, it's really an important one for where leaders have got to sponsor the outcome that they're looking for. 
I would tell you that once you sort of pass through that um, the developmental phase and then the implementation phase, uh, you enter into a phase of, of what I would call the good data phase. There is where everything's working. You've got confidence in the data. There's good consistency. There's a good understanding among the stakeholders about what's being measured. You understand the calculations and maybe some of the limitations of the metrics. I would tell you that, that, that that's also often accompanied by a gnawing feeling uh, that you don't have vis visibility to exactly what you want to see. Um, so that, in turn, tends to drive uh, future iterations uh, as you go through. But typically, I, I encourage folks to stand up a, a dashboard at least for a year to sort of learn the metrics and get into that good data phase. So you start to b develop some of the behavioral and the leadership aspects uh, that, are, that are equally as important as the data component of a dashboard. So, Paul, looking, you just talked about the three phases, the developmental phase, the implementation phase, and the, the good data phase, as you called it. Um, so is it natural to have these dashboards evolve over time, or do they stay the same? Oh, absolutely. You know, there are certainly some common metrics that stay the same, but there, there are different aspects and different measures that fall off and, and get uh, rolled in as you, as you mature in your, in your program. I always thought, you know, earlier in my career, I always thought that that the fact that we would modify dashboards over time was maybe a failing in in us not standing up the right measures to begin with. And I I, I actually attended a conference over in Atlanta a few years ago, and a, and a company called Scorecard Incorporated uh, did a great presentation on what they learned. And, and, and all they did was stand up, um, they use their software to stand up dashboards in their, or scorecards in their, uh, in their clients. And I, I've forgotten a lot of what they said, but the thing that I really remember was that they, they said that, uh, the typical scorecard or dashboard that they stood up goes through nine different iterations before the leadership team felt it was a really powerful tool that drove business improvement. So that, to me, was real validation that that it is natural to have uh, dashboards evolve over time. But, you know, stepping away a little bit from the from the iterations, really the, the program maturity of your reliability program is really the, the big knob, you know, that, that determines what's going to be constituting the metrics, uh, you know, actually on your dashboard. I, I would I always like to make analogies, and I, would, I I have been a bicycle rider over the over the uh, course of my career, and I've always been sort of a casual weekend rider and a, occasional you know bouts of commuting to work and so forth. But so for me as a casual rider, there were things that I paid attention to just as a as a as a cyclist, you know, like how long was I in the saddle, you know, what was the length of the ride, you know, I I would look at the average speed off of my uh, cyclo computer. Um, I might total up in my head, you know, the number of miles per week. But I, I read one of uh, uh, a book that was put together by a Tour de France competitor, and, and they had a whole um, discussion on, like, what they look at to drive and monitor their improvement. And, it, and I didn't even recognize them. It certainly wasn't miles per week, and it certainly wasn't average speed. But really, they were looking at, like, you know, like watts generated while in the saddle. They wow. were looking at maximum oxygen uptake. Uh, of the of the actual athlete, they were monitoring blood level, blood lead level, or uh, blood levels of lactic acid. So, so you know, they were they even though they were on a bicycle, they were playing a completely different game, and the measures reflected that. So, so in that very same way, somebody's at the very beginning of the reliability journey. There are going to be metrics and measures that make sense for their. Um, sort of fledgling efforts versus somebody that's maybe seven or, or ten years into a reliability journey. So, for for example, somebody that's at the beginning of their journey, they might be looking at PM compliance. You know, how how good are we at sure, at okay. actually completing our preventative maintenance um, that's scheduled? They might be looking at percent of maintenance labor. Uh, that is captured in the CMMS. A lot of times, it's a real struggle for folks to even get jobs to be captured in their in their whether it's in SAP or Maximo or what have you. Uh, so that might be something that they really focus on early on. Um, if they're going through, for example, a, a PM optimization effort, they might be looking at the P, percent of PMs optimized. 
But on the other end of the spectrum, you know, a really mature site that's been practicing and applying the best practices for for a long time, uh, they might be measuring like the number of corrected uh, number of corrective work orders generated off of a PM. They might be uh, tracking the number of parts that are returned to stores after a kit is utilized. They might be looking at the percent improvement of OEE after a major RCM event on a critical piece of equipment. So, the the measures get very 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 different different depending upon what are your program developmental challenges at that particular point in time. Okay, so interesting, Paul. You, you, you talk about where or what might be measured during the beginning of the journey or different phases of the journey in general, but since you have obvious extensive experience standing up these dashboards, what kind of metrics do you most often see yourself? Again, it depends on program maturity, sure. but there there are some very common things that are on almost all of them. There There's typically going to be some measure of production efficiency. Um, we love to see OEE. Sometimes the uh, programmatic elements or the technologies not in place to, to measure OEE. So there's some, going to be some measure of production efficiency. I think it's uh, critical also to include safety performance on a reliability excellence dashboard. So uh, oftentimes people will have uh, some some incident rate or um, or what have you uh, for safety. Um, oftentimes there's a cost indicator. So whether it's a cost per pound or whether it's a, a conversion cost or uh, or a um, or maybe an improvement in year over year productivity that 's typically on there that 's an especially important one because it, especially as it relates to telling the story because a lot of times you know these reliability journeys get stood up based on a business case, and a lot of times it it 's really in fact not a lot of times it it is just absolutely critical that you are measuring the improvement in cost that you justify the initiative around so the the reliability excellence dashboard is a is a great spot to have that metric uh, be up front and visible in front of all the leaders at the site. Um, so the cost indicators are typically on there. Storeroom metrics are are really vital. A couple of, of vital ones at a at a higher level, maybe at a plant manager level, are inventory accuracy. Just simply how accurate are our levels of the parts that we say we have. It could be what is the number of obsolete or slow moving items could be the total inventory um, value that's within the storeroom. So some some critical ones for the storeroom are, are typically included. Uh, we like to see typically a host of uh, maintenance department metrics, for example, the uh, uh, percent of overtime. Uh, we like to see some planning and scheduling metrics over there, for example, the scheduling accuracy, uh, the schedule uh, percent completion, um, the scheduling efficiency is another good one. Oftentimes, if there are uh, reliability engineers in the organization, we like to see uh, some key reliability engineering metrics on there. For example, like uh, the number of root cause analysis um, events that have been triggered and root cause investigations that have been completed. Uh, we like to see, for example, if a PM optimization program is going on, we might have some percent of of, them, of, of completion rate around that. But but generally, um, as as you move away from some of those sort of uh, no brainers to have on there, you would typically see a really a mix of leading and lagging indicators um, that are there. Uh, and and I I really encourage people, especially early on, to have a mix of both program development goals as well as results monitoring. For example, program development is is all about focusing and measuring on the things that are helping to build your program. You know, it, it's like if you were going to measure, say, the percent of assets that have been analyzed for criticality. Very early in your journey, maybe 0% of them have been done. So, And, and you might be a really complex site with 80,000 assets, so it's going to take you multiple years uh, unless you devote some specific resources to it. It could take you a series of years to get all those assets analyzed for criticality. Any of the program development goals are a lot like, you know, I got a bunch of grass to mow and how much have I done? So if you got 100 acres, you've got, you know, 50 acres of it done, then you feel good. So analyzing for criticality is like that. Uh, getting a hierarchy corrected can be done. Uh, looking at as percent of completion, PM optimizations done, uh, PM development for critical assets is another one. That's a good program uh, development goal. Very early, if you're even even 
earlier in the journey and you're trying to develop you know the fundamental processes for example in the uh, materials uh, realm we will like to have about 20 uh, specific processes prepared so a lot of times when that work is being done you might be tracking the percent of, of of those 20 processes that are being developed now if you step away from the program development aspect of it there there are results monitoring uh, as well and the more mature the site is the more of a percentage of results monitoring metrics are going to be on there so for example if you've got OEE and performance on a critical line that's had a major uh, RCM event focused on it, uh, that might be a, a, a critical one. Um, your OEE a lot of times can be started to Im be improved, If, for example, if your uh, PM completion rate is going up. So typically they're giving you some visibility to we've done a lot of work and is that particular area getting better? I know for, for me in my, at, at my first operation that I was at, we paid a lot of attention to our total percent of, of labor that we had that was being uh, used on planned and scheduled jobs. And when we very first calculated that metric, we had a total of 17% total schedule compliance. And you fast forward four years later, we had about 80% of our labor that was being executed on planned and scheduled work. So the, the results of that were... Um, were, were huge and powerful and transforming for the operation, but the inclusion of that particular metric on our dashboard and having it in front of us all the time it really forced us to, to work through some major barriers and, and some major uh, thresholds that we had. So, okay, interesting. You, you did state that, you know, depending on where you are in your reliability, reliability excellence journey, you, it kind of depends on what you'd like to measure. But, you know, is there such a thing as measuring too much, you know, because there's all this data coming in. And when, when does it become too much that you just can't keep up with it all? Yeah, that, that's really an excellent point. It, it's been my experience that I like to keep a plant-level reliability excellence dashboard right around the dozen or so metrics. Um, it, it's very difficult to manage, you know, two and three pages of metrics. And, 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 and I see people make that mistake all the time. And because there's so much, you don't get to apply some of the leadership and the behavioral aspects of the dashboard when it's a much smaller one. So what, what, I, what I really learned was that when you have a, a small and a much more manageable component, there's a lot that gets caught up in the net when you're trying to drive those particular metrics for improvement. But I do have to counsel uh, clients routinely about trying not to measure so much but uh, focus uh, on, on maybe 10 or 12. I'm glad you said that just because when I think about this uh, reliability excellence dashboard, I compare it to myself in my mind to Google Analytics. Sure. There's so much data there, and, and that's why I think Google Analytics has its own little dashboard setting. So I get what you're saying. So, uh, But I do want to say, as we get ready to wrap up this episode, um, we would conclude by discussing some behavioral and leadership aspects of an RX dashboard. So what's so critical about this? Well, it's everything. If you set up a dashboard and, and just have uh, pixels on a screen, you know you're not going to get uh, <laughs> you're not going to get improvement through that. You know, and and I would I would give you the example of of like uh, your iPhone, right? There are hundreds of thousands of people in the United States that that have an iPhone in their back pocket, or, uh, you know, and it is counting their steps on a daily basis. And because that data is there, and they can go and look at it. Um, but that it's not being in, used to influence their activity level at all. But there are a group of users of the iPhone that track their steps on, on the iPhone, and they've set some goals around it. So the behavioral and the leadership aspects are really everything uh, related to the dashboard. And, and at its core, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to create some healthy tension among your stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, typically it's your, your direct reports at a plant level. Color coding, as simple as it is, can, can be enormously powerful. So I always encourage folks to set up classic uh, red or green or, or yellow status indicator um, that really focuses, am I meeting the goal or am I, am I not? And, and it absolutely drives competition and execution because of a very simple point. People don't like to be read. And when they, you know, it really gets under their craw if they're responsible for a, for a particular metric. And if it's read, uh, and especially if it's baked into the performance um, uh, discussion uh, for the year, whether they're meeting their goals and objectives, people do not like to be read. 
So, you know, there, there has to be some regular review of the dashboard. So um, people do this in a variety of different ways. I, I was at a site um, in Jackson, Tennessee a few weeks ago that was just absolutely excellent. And they did. Uh, they made extensive use of gimbal walks on a daily basis, and and their their leaders paid attention to uh, to dashboards that were present on visual displays, uh, looking you know at a at a variety of different indicators. Uh, but uh, monthly staff meetings is a, is another uh, way to do it. But but the bottom line is that there's got to be some regular review of the dashboard, and there has to be some discussion of the results by a leader. You know, so leaders are are monitoring those metrics, and and candidly, they create tension in a healthy way to reach those goals, and, and they also raise the bar on performance expectations year over year. So. Oftentimes, a plateau is reached, and you've got to be really creative to bust through that new level of, of, of performance. For example, I, I mentioned a metric that we used to track a lot called total schedule compliance. And we, we started at 17% in the first couple of years. We, we did really well and drove that up to about 50 or 55%. And then we plateaued for, for a series of a couple of years, and we just could not get through um, that particular plateau. So what we realized was that there was a number of things that our maintenance um, employees were doing. And in fact, they were, they were doing um, uh, job changes. So instead of, uh, so a, a job change in our, in our uh, vernacular was simply, we were going from one product to the other. And, and because you had to set up different tooling and different pieces of downstream equipment, and, and tools and wrenches were involved in doing that. Our, our maintenance folks, from a cultural standpoint, had always historically done that work. But at its real core, a, a product change is not maintenance work. You are not returning uh, the the asset to its actual condition. So, so we were getting really no no return on on our maintenance labor that was going there. So, we we understood intuitively that we had to move our um, our people out of the product change business and transition that more to being an operator perform thing. So it, it's a longer story to talk about how we did that, but to suffice it to say that that we created some, um, some additional compensation for our operators uh, once they became cross-checked in, in doing their own product changes. They were able to absorb that work, and they got paid for doing it, but that also um, delivered back about 65 or 70 hours of maintenance labor that we could now invest in applying their, their time to things that were going to uh, help us move down the road. So, and, and that, you know, took a little bit of uh, time to do, but that was the event that drove us into 65 and 75 and even 80% levels wow. of uh, schedule compliance. And you can't really talk about dashboards without talking about the aspects of unhealthy behaviors around dashboards. Um, I, I really encourage leaders to understand what metrics are on your dashboard, understand how they're calculated, and, and really utilize them to expose the reality of your current performance. It's just epidemic in North American business that there's data integrity problems come up related to it. So uh, typically the data integrity problems uh, come up when when folks are doing plant-to-plant -plant comparison or when a, when a leader sets a goal too high for a level of program maturity. So, for example, I, I had... Um, uh, I, I worked recently with a large chemical company, and they had a leader that was just on fire for the reliability journey, but he had done some casual reading where he saw that uh, that world-class performance was that 80% of your work should be planned and scheduled. So he, in, in turn, set the goal for the organization to do that. Well, and, and then he started beating on them to, you know, to, to, to have that goal um, uh, be attained. Well, the, the reality was that they were years away from being able to do a, a true 80% planned and scheduled work because their infrastructure was a mess, their, their, uh, their technical competencies or their people weren't at that level of improvement. So they got to the 80% planned and scheduled level, but it was through un, it was basically through manipulating the data and doing intra-week um, schedule changes, which are not in accordance with best practices. Mm. So, so the numbers showed that they were doing really well, 
but when you really dug into the the details they were they were gaming the system so i i really encourage you know leaders to understand how things are calculated to pay attention and periodically audit those um those calculations because at the end of the day you're you're robbing yourself of a, of an improvement opportunity if there's too much pressure on the metrics in the in the data integrity is not there so um that so really as we as we sort of talk through those things i would say that the behavioral and leadership aspects of the data dashboard are just super critical to actually driving performance in the organization. Amazing. And being you're the dashboard expert here in this conversation right now, um, we covered a lot today, uh, a lot of great stuff, a uh, wealth of information. So I'll have you, I normally, I try to summarize this discussion, but how would you wrap up this conversation in about three to four bullet points? Well, that's, uh, that, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, a lot of potatoes to put in a five pound bag. But, uh, you know, I, I would, I would say a few things. Um, maybe moving up to the 25,000 foot level. Sure. Um, a, a reliability excellence dashboard is a vital tool in your reliability journey. Um, fully expect as a leader to expend some energy to both establish it initially and to have it reflect critical measures as your reliability program develops. Reaffirming what I just spoke of, uh, the leadership behaviors and creating healthy tension is really more critical to driving your program forward than having a perfect suite of metrics. So get the behaviors right and, and uh, with data integrity, um, and you'll, you'll really experience some good forward momentum. But that last point I'd love to, to reinforce is just insisting on data integrity. Lots of nonsense creeps into measurement systems when goals are unrealistic. And um, it's just vital that you uh, that your your real performance be displayed on your um, on your dashboards. So uh, that's at least a stab uh, to to how to, to how to wrap all that up. <laughs> and Paul, I know we're going to end the show right there, but I do want to tell the listeners that a lot of the stuff that you talked about today regarding this visual dashboard management dashboard, you know, we have a lot more information on the PoweredByRx.com website. It's basically our reliability excellence microsite, and it's a great resource portal for information like this and and other tidbits of information regarding your reliability excellence journey. So if you go to PoweredByRx.com, there's 29 element model that'll appear right there on the page, and you can click on each element to learn more, uh, just kind of depending on where you are at in your journey. Um, So for this instance, what we're really talking about is um, in the upper right hand part of that model, Model is management reporting element. So if you click on that, you can find information about the dashboard and integrating a reliability excellence dashboard. With that being said, Paul, I just really want to thank you for being on the podcast now for the second time. And I'm sure, I'm sure we'll have you on for a third time. Okay. Well, very good. Well, thanks for the opportunity to chat. Absolutely, Paul. Thank you. Hey, listeners, one more thing before you go. If you have any feedback for this show or this episode in particular, please hit us up on Twitter at LCE underscore today or email the show at podcast at LCE.com. We're always open to future episode ideas, so please let us know if you have any. Thanks for joining, and we look forward to another episode of the Asset Reliability at Work podcast.